Andrew joined uh, the RAF in 20 years ago, um, and he had a Bachelor of Technology in Aeronautical Engineering from the UNSW ADFA. In 2012, um, he was selected to study Master of Physics in Space Science at the Royal Military College in Canada, and at the same time completing Master of Strategy and Security at UNS UNSW Canberra. He'll talk about neuromorphic event sensors for machine vision applications. Um, let's welcome Andrew. Thanks very much, Vince. And there you go. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, more about some of the advantages of the event-based sensors that uh, Vlad mentioned, uh, and also some of the experiments that we've been doing at Western Sydney University that might lead to future capabilities that use these sensors. Uh, of which there are numerous, so I'll uh, just get right into it. So to start off with, you've heard about uh, how these sensors are very high dynamic range, uh, and that means that you can see in the field of view in a scene um, both dark and bright areas at the same time uh, without that affecting the ability to, uh, to distinguish what's in the scene. You might remember uh, the images on the top here from about 15 minutes ago in Vlad's presentation. Uh, but you can notice uh, that in the dark areas of the scene, particularly in that uh, the bottom scene on the left there with the conventional sensor, we're not able to uh, distinguish much detail regarding the buildings that are in the background that you are able to distinguish with the event-based sensor and at the same time the bright lights which are saturating the pixels in the conventional sensor aren't really affecting the event-based sensor quite as much. So we uh, did an experiment where we pointed one of these cameras uh, at the sun which is what you can see on the right there uh, with a quadcopter drone uh, flying uh, on the left of the screen to see whether or not uh, we were able to uh, track that uh, with the sun in the field of view, which we were able to do, and we were able to see how fast, determine how fast those rotor blades are spinning. And it was a little bit too easy, so we asked this insect here if it would mind just flying back and forth in front of the sun a few times for us. Uh, and lo and behold, just like a surface-to-air missile not being seduced by flares, we were able to maintain tracking on the insect uh, fairly easily. Um, so staring at Flies might not be your thing, but perhaps you're interested in satellites. So we're in conjunction with electro-optic systems, EOS space systems up at Mount Stromlo, using their facilities there. We've done some observations of, of satellites. Actually, you can see they've got a uh, laser ranging facility up there at Stromlo as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the, okay, swapping microphones. So the laser ranging facility is uh, on this dome here. I can, I can just faintly see the laser beam uh, coming out of it. it must be faint because whoever did this uh, picture incorrectly drew a laser beam coming out of the telescope dome. Uh, so we've used their facility there to, to look at uh, some, some satellites and um, for quite a number of years researchers have been using traditional sensors to measure the brightness of satellites uh, and to try and infer information from that as a result. So we did the same thing with the event-based sensor uh, and you can see in this uh, um, plot of the event rate, so that's the, uh, the number of events that the camera is generating uh, per unit of time associated with that satellite on the right here, which is a global star satellite. Uh, you might be able to infer quite easily from the plots on the left there that this satellite is tumbling, and so we get uh, these, these spikes of event rate uh, as you get the, uh, the bright flashes off the satellite. Uh, so I mentioned that this was to do with the high dynamic range of the sensor. With traditional sensors, uh, you can often get uh, issues when you're trying to perform such photometry where you get saturation when you get the bright glints off the satellite, and then other times it's too faint to uh, accurately measure the brightness. We don't get that issue with the event-based sensors where we're easily able to handle both situations. Uh, and just zooming in on that plot there, uh, you can see, I won't go into too much detail, but by analysing uh, such features as the, the magnitude and the width of these event rate spikes, whether they're the on events for brightness increase or the off events for brightness decrease, we can in infer things about the satellite information about it, such as the rotation rate, axis of rotation, the materials doing the reflection, whether it's operational or tumbling, that sort of thing. Uh, and not only that, but we don't need to acquire gigabytes of data and take it away and process it. We can do it as we're going, which is what you can see here. So the, the top part of the screen there is a, a, a rendering of the recording. The satellite and those stars that you can see streaking across the field of view are being automatically identified uh, and uh, the st in the case of the stars ignored, in the case of the satellite, uh, the event rate and the brightness being measured as we go. So we thought it'd be interesting to have a look at um, what we can see when the uh, satellite laser ranging facility is lasing satellites. 
Uh, it might be a little bit hard to, to see with the lights on there, but the satellite is this yellow spot there. And uh, we can also see the laser beam um, passing through the atmosphere there. So we can see the laser beam because the green laser light is scattered off particles in the atmosphere. It's, it's quite difficult to see with the naked eye, but uh, we are able to detect it. So again, demonstrating the impressive dynamic range of the sensor. But not only that, the, uh, the laser beam is a 60 hertz pulse, uh, which is what you're able to see being detected in the plot here where we've got those, uh, the, the green lines, uh, sorry, the green line representing the event rate spiking uh, periodically uh, at 60 hertz, which is indicated by those red lines that I've just drawn on the plot there. Uh, what's particularly impressive about that is that the pulse width of this laser is something like 10 picoseconds, I believe. So, uh, oh, in addition, we're able to also detect that 60 hertz uh, pulse rate, uh, not from the just not just from the reflections of the satellite, but from the scatter uh, the, of the light um, passing, passing through the atmosphere, which is what you can see here. So, yeah, high dynamic range also uh, demonstrates the high speed of the sensor. Uh, so one experiment that we did um, with TELUS out at their range at Lithgow was to set up a event-based camera, which um, I'm just pointing out there on the screen, about 40 metres away from a firing location, uh, and you can see the, the target on this uh, hill there in the distance, um, just to see how we would go at um, tracking the rounds. Uh, this is what the output looks like in real time of the sensor. It'll play. Quite a number of insects flying around there as well that you can see. Um, and uh, you can make out that there's a couple of people standing there and that's the rifle being fired. Uh, slowed down considerably, uh, the output looks like that. So you can see uh, some events associated with a reflection off an object uh, when there's the, the flash um, from the round being fired. And you can also see the round being tracked across the screen there. Now admittedly there are some breaks in the tracking as it passes across the field of view, but the two points to consider. First of all, Western Sydney sent only their least capable researcher out to do this experiment. Secondly, we're talking about a 6.5 millimetre round travelling at 840 metres per second uh, being tracked from 40 metres away. So that's pretty impressive in my mind, uh, but the, the point to consider is uh, more that this demonstrates the potential ability to track something that we might be able to do something about, unlike a rifle round, such as uh, rockets, indirect fire, hypersonic missile, that sort of thing. Uh, with the event-based cameras, what hasn't been mentioned is that we can also change the internal settings of the cameras so that they're uh, either more or less noisy or sensitive. Um, and if we reduce the sensitivity considerably, and uh, again looking at the, the same scene of the, the rifle being fired, if I reduce the sensitivity enough that we filter out everything in the background, um, you can see only the uh, events associated with the, the rifle shot. Um, or you can particularly when we turn the lights down. I'll just replay that again. Um, so that's uh, very characteristic of the rifle being fired. You're not going to be able to detect anything in the natural environment uh, if, say, you're driving around in an a, uh, armoured vehicle or something on the lookout for enemy firing locations. So high dynamic range, high speed, and the low data rates again, which has been mentioned already, uh, it's highlighted nicely in this video here of a scan eagle coming in to be captured. The conventional center, so, sorry, conventional sensor on the top left there at 60 frames per second uh, is acquiring in the time that I've been talking over 3.7 gigabytes now, whereas the event-based sensor in the total time that I've been talking has acquired 58 megabytes of data, so that's considerably less data, orders of magnitude less, that needs to be captured, stored, processed, transmitted. Also low size, weight and power, or low swap. So an experiment that we're planning on doing in the middle of the year with Equatorial Launch Australia at their Arnhem Space Centre just outside of Nulamboy is to place some sensors uh, at and around the launch location of uh, three sounding rockets that will be launched at 240 kilometres altitude. Uh, they'll, they'll come back in and land uh, uh, around about the end of this uh, uh, red arrow there, about uh, 200 kilometres away. Um, so we want to just see how these sensors perform at tracking the launch of the vehicle to nighttime uh, activity as well, uh, see whether or not we can uh, detect the, the payload coming out of the rocket and also the rocket as it comes back in 
uh, at presumably fairly high speed. What's that got to do with low size, weight and power? Well, this is the equipment that NASA has on site at the moment uh, for them to track their rockets. Uh, so that, I think, juxtaposes nicely with an event-based sensor that you're able to hold in your hand, admittedly probably with a telescope to attach to it. So completing the in-through and from space uh, trilogy, we've uh, also got the Falcon Euro satellite uh, that's been uh, mentioned before as well. Um, I've got a, a photograph of where it is at the moment. To, it's in that red circle there on the International Space Station. It's, uh, it's not the first event-based sensor in orbit. Uh, that, uh, the, the, the first event-based sensor that was in orbit uh, was on the M2 satellites, um, which was a, uh, a joint UNSW Western Sydney Uni uh, partnership. Um, this Falcon Neuro satellite was a partnership between Western Sydney University and the US Air Force Academy. Uh, but I can show you some data from, from this one, from the Falcon Euro satellite. What we're seeing here is uh, on the bottom right a video of the data, uh, essentially in real time as it's being captured. It looks pretty horrendous, but uh, with some processing, um, you can put together this strip image um, here, uh, which uh, also I should say we're, we're not limited um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the amount of data that we capture or for how long we're capturing data. So a fair bit of processing is required to uh, put these events into the correct location such that we can create a, uh, an image of what we're looking at. But when we're talking about sort of uh, megabytes per second of information, uh, where we are able to continuously expose and produce essentially an arbitrarily long uh, image uh, on the ground, such as this one here of Sharm El Sheikh Airport that you can see at night in the centre of that, that image there. So I might be thinking a little bit further towards the future, but it's easy to consider a Starlink-like constellation of satellites uh, that can provide a full motion video version of Google Earth. And it's probably also easy to imagine the ethical considerations and privacy considerations for that as well. Um, so all of that uh, leads to the final point, which is that these sensors uh, open the way for novel processing methods. Um, I'll just finish off with one example because I'm just about out of time. Um, so we did this uh, experiment here where we dropped uh, four different aircraft models that you can see there from a height of about a metre in front of an event-based camera. We train an artificial intelligence algorithm to try to uh, identify the aircraft that are being dropped. I've got a, a video of it here. Just see if you can identify the aircraft being dropped. There we go. Any ideas? The event-based sensor performed a little bit better than I was able to. In something like high 90s percent of cases, uh, it was correctly identifying the aircraft within about 50 milliseconds. Uh, I've got a couple of other e examples as well that I'm happy to share with you individually afterwards, but I think we're out of time, so I might just leave it there and ask if there are any questions. question was about tracking space junk with the sensor and uh, yeah, I can not only imagine it but that is one of the things that Western Sydney Uni um, have been doing as well. Uh, so Western Sydney has a astrocyte capability that was um, built in partnership with Jericho um, specifically for that purpose uh, in addition to the characterisation of satellites that I spoke about. I didn't go into any of that at all but uh, yeah absolutely they, they have the ability to persistently scan the sky so um, they're they are in some ways quite well suited to, to tracking. Yeah, so, so uh, as things stand at the moment, if there's a collision on orbit and it wasn't observed as it occurred, um, when you notice that there are new pieces of debris on orbit, um, you've got a, a bit of a, a lot of work on your hands to try and figure out um, what resulted in that debris and backtrack towards the collision. Um, with event-based sensors, since they are able to just permanently monitor the skies, assuming you've got a wide enough field of view or good enough search capability uh, that uh, does raise the potential for being able to uh, detect these events uh, a little bit closer to when they occur, if not as they occur. I've got a question. So the event-based sensor is a differential density sensor? That Effect yeah, effectively. Effectively, yes. But you can also do that optically by having a Laplace transform. And, uh, how does that, if you place a filter, that re just re removes the DC and this measures the, um, the high frequency components, and you could practically do a... Um, and in, 
a Laplace transform on the w with image. the event yeah. sensors. Yeah. Um, and so you'll be doing that for uh, what? What's the uh, the result of doing that processing? No, it, the output is the same as, as doing a, a differential output. But I can talk to you on that separately. Sure. But well, Vlad can answer it. Vlad can answer it. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's let's thank um, Andrew.